Hi, Dave. Hi, Eric. Hey, Dave. Do we curse on this podcast? Yes, Eric. Yes, we do. Are you ready, kids? Get your parents' permission, check your mailbox, and grab your shopping cart. It's time for the Adventures in Collecting podcast. I'm Eric. And I'm Dave. Welcome Welcome to to Adventures Adventures in in Collecting. Collecting where we talk toy news, culture, and hauls, along with our journeys as collectors. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Adventures in Collecting. Uh, it's, it's Eric and Dave, and we have a special guest, right, Dave? We do. So uh, we're, we're going to go right into things, because uh, our, our guest today is, is very special um, and is a longtime pillar of the figure community and the collecting community. Um, you may know him from his time with Jack Specific and is one of the co-presidents of Wicked Cool Toys. Uh, he's now a partner at Jazzwares. We, of course, are talking about Jeremy Padauer. Welcome to the show, Jeremy. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. Great to talk to you guys. We're, we're so happy to have you. Again, thank you for, for taking the time to, to, uh, to join our, our little toy collecting show today. Yeah, awesome. this is really cool. Thank you. Of course. I'm, uh, I'm at your service. I'm ready to chat. I'm ready to chat. Let's chat it up. So before we we dive headlong into things, uh, when we have a guest on, the first thing that we like to do is we like to ask them what they're currently collecting and and what toy line or, or collectible has you most excited at the moment. Well, uh, let's see. I'm currently collecting uh, Pokemon cards, primarily vintage cards. Uh, I just bought a 1999 uh, base set, the first series Shadowless. Uh, PSA 10 card one through 102 and uh, that's that that really hit the news big this week I don't know if you saw it but um, it was the highest price paid ever for a uh, original base set we did indeed congratulations by the way thank you thank you very much yeah that was that was a lot of fun and I'm glad uh, I'm glad I had the opportunity to uh, to to do that Um, but you know I will say that that I uh, Pokemon is a special place in my heart. You know, they I've been part of the brand for the last 15 years and had the opportunity to see it, it grow into uh, what it is today, which is one of the most important uh, brands in the history of uh, entertainment. Um, but I also collect um, vintage, you know, sports cards. Uh, I like uh, some of the TCGs from the early 2000s. Like I bought a couple of Harry Potter booster uh, boxes. Um, some Neopets booster boxes, um, and uh, Project Tops Project 2020, which is a very cool card concept, like card meets art concept. And of course, you know, I'm a, I manufacture action figures of all kinds: Fortnite, Roblox, uh, Pokemon, AEW, and uh, Halo is launching this year. So there's just a lot going on. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things where I, I think when people think when people talk to you and you know and mention and mention your name i think a lot of times you you are kind of synonymous with the the wrestling figure community because yeah. of what you've what you did you know previously with Jax and what you're doing with with AEW now but yeah pokemon is such an it's it's such a cultural phenomenon like and and i mean i I'm uh I'm 32 years old, so I was right in that butter zone when oh, sure. when Pokemon landed here in the U.S. Like I remember getting it, you know, getting my yellow tag out of the uh the the Toys R Us wall and getting it on on Game Boy originally, like the red and blue games, and you know trading the cards at school. So it's very nostalgic for me, and I I still kind of dabble in Pokemon, like with like Pokemon Go and and uh and and some of the more modern iterations of things, but. Yeah, when I when I saw that uh, that you had um, that you had purchased that lot of cards, I was it brought me back. <laughs> well, I'll tell you this. So, um, interestingly enough, so 1999 is when they launched. So, if you're 32, that means you were 11. Um, and if you think about it, uh, the Pokemon set that I bought, I mean, it's public. I paid 129 thousand five hundred dollars for it. Okay. Now, I'm going to set that into context in a moment. Um, but 129,500, this set, uh, in all PSA 10 condition five years ago was probably around $35,000 and five years before that it may have been 10 and five years before that it was more like two. So the reality is whenever you look at a collectible system, 
it's really only as valuable as the most emotionally impacted people have the money to purchase into it. So what I mean by that is in 1999, the average age demographic for Pokemon was probably, I don't know, 6 to 12 years old or maybe 13, which means today they're between the ages of 25 and 33. And when you're between the ages of 25 and 33, the odds that you have the kind of expendable income yet is not significantly high. Now, there are some people that have some serious cash walking around money, and a lot of them earned it on their own. But the reality is, you, you, like people my age, I'm 46, um, you, you're sort of in the prime of your career. You may have sold a company. You may just be crushing it one way or the other. But give it another 10 or 15 years, and I think you're going to see Pokemon valuation spike tremendously because you'll see that the individuals who are part of that brand uh, are now fully, deeply into their uh, into their careers and lives. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely had some, you know, just, just looking at it, had some a little bit of FOMO because I recently sold some of my cards. Like, I, I still had them. I, they were oh, in a binder. And, like, I know that I definitely got hosed on the deal because I just I didn't know that there was a, a market for Pokemon cards because I definitely had... I didn't have, like, a shadow a shadowless Charizard or anything, but, like, I had, you know, shadowless first-gen cards. Um, you know, you, you actually had tweeted out, you know, what, what was your favorite Pokemon? I actually had a, a shadowless first-edition um, foil Dragonite in that set that I definitely yeah. sold. So, you know, I, yeah. it's... It's uh, you know, it's it's fun to think about cards, and and I know Dave could could speak to it more than I can, but he, you know, and my father, they they collected baseball cards like almost yeah, religiously. Was, oh, really? Big, cool. Baseball cards back in the day, yeah. And and so, like, what what sort of stuff did you uh, did you collect into? What were you into? Um, um you know, I'm 39, so it was the you know mid late 80s. So that was when oh yeah, every everything. Everything was worth something, but everything wound up being worth nothing. But so, you, let, let me give you, let me give you, let me flip that switch for a moment. So the late '80s cards. So I've recently bought some cards in the highest grade condition from the late '80s. Like for instance, mm -hmm. I, I think I paid thirteen hundred dollars for an Upper Deck Ken Griffey Jr. nineteen eighty nine rookie. I okay. think everyone knows what that card looks like. Just kind of you can visualize it. But it was a PSA ten perfect condition card. And so I, what I would say is, it's interesting, the highest level cards from each one of those sets has value as long as it can be graded in perfect condition. The difference between a PSA 10 and a PSA 9 could be 7, 8, 9, 10 times. And you keep going down, all of a sudden you've got something that has even the slightest flaw and it becomes worth you know, a few bucks, where if it was perfect condition, it's worth a, a real grip of money. And so, you know, what I would say is take revisit those binders and catalogs from the late 80s and early 90s and look for the very few superstars that may be rookies in those years. And if you can find like a pristine card, it may or may not be worth getting it graded. It's definitely something to think about for sure. I, I'm I'm sitting over here, so we're we're you know we're in two different places right now. We're both in New Jersey, but you know practicing social distancing, all all that good stuff. Cool. Um, I'm sitting here smiling because I know what's sitting in our mother's basement. Oh. Yeah, I, I know it's there too. <laughs> I do. They would buy c full cases, so there's cards from those those years that are in original cases have never been opened. Excellent. And so again, w take a look at the latest. I would say look at psacard.com and look at the population reports for the very specific years that you're talking about. And while these sets um, don't have a tremendous amount of value from the late 80s, you might want to pull the two or three most valuable cards out of it and get them graded. If you get back a PSA 10, heck, it might be worth you know 10 times what the set was worth, just that one card, because it's graded so favorably. So... Outside of outside of baseball cards, you have yeah. been and and card collecting in general, which ha it has been it's been fun to watch you you know open up some of those those booster packs and stuff on on social media. But your social media presence as as of late has been very much so about giving back to the community, and and that kind of all started with the showing off the the one out of one hundred uh, 
Ultimate Warrior. So w- what spurred the kind of uh, redirection the of your social media efforts? And, yeah, and the amazing games? generosity. Yeah. Well, I mean, life life changed. I mean, I so for, for so many years, I, I was uh, an executive. And you guys hit on an executive at Jackson before that, Mattel. And um, I was, uh, you know, it was, a, it was great. Uh, but I, we, you know, got involved with uh, an early stage startup that we, that I partnered in and we grew significantly and we sold it. Um, and now we're partners at Jazzwares. Um, but we had grown a really large company. I mean, we were the global master partner for Pokemon and we have, like I said, AEW and Halo and Micro Machines and just some tremendous brands. So um, that turned out very favorably for me. And I'm not the type of person that likes to sit on all the donuts. I just, I, I don't enjoy just consuming. I like, you know, sharing. And so for me, I had the platform, we had AEW launching. I knew that I had a bit of a community within the old classic superstars, Ruthless Aggression, Adrenaline, um, Deluxe, uh, aggression, all those wonderful things that we did back in the day. And I knew that there were still some folks that may want to hear from me. And I thought, wow, what a great opportunity to pair what I want to do, which is to give back to the community that I really dearly love and, and feel so much indebtedness to, um, because I can now. Uh, so yeah, I mean, like my objective is to build a social media presence. Um, but to do it, um, talking about the business of collecting, but also uh, to share uh, some fun stuff. And if it's merchandise, then it's merchandise. But that's my philosophy. And I think, I think a lot of people who have succeeded in business tend to hide after they succeed. And I think that uh, that doesn't do any good for the next generation of people that are trying to accomplish the same thing. And so I'm definitely going to do the exact opposite. I'll be way more visible now that I've, you know, feel like I've achieved, you know, a lot of the things that I had dreamed about achieving. Now, you mentioned the uh, classic superstars, and that was a yeah. game changer back in the Jax days, because yeah. there'd never been anything mainstream like that with with classic superstars. Um, it celebrated the history of wrestling. Um, what led you to pursue that idea? So when I when I started at Jax, I was 29 years old. And um, I'll take you back. But as a kid, I grew up in the South um, and uh, a Jewish little Jewish kid from the South. Right. Mississippi, Tennessee. And and I just loved wrestling. I really loved it. And so we had regional wrestling and especially in Memphis, USWA and in Mississippi, whoever would come through, dare come through Columbus, Mississippi. But you would see all the regional wrestlers and, and you got a real good taste for these self-made personalities. And then, you know, in the, uh, in the early eighties, uh, WWE came on the scene in a, or WWF at the time came on the scene in a major way. Um, and I just had a really good sense for that business. So when I got to Jack's, it was one of the very first things I did at 29 years old was say, listen, we need to celebrate the legends. Um, and so interestingly enough, I had the opportunity to have conversations with Vince McMahon and, he gave me the green light to approach uh, legends because really the the toy business was challenged at the time. Uh, you can imagine the Attitude Era was just over, and toy sales had plummeted because toys had been treated like um, toys and not collectibles. Um, the challenge was, you know, signing these superstars because they there was no real alumni roster. So I had to figure out a deal mechanism where I would go out and sign these individual athletes um, or the estates of. And then if WWE should ever have an alumni program, they could then take over those contracts, create a new contract, and the athlete would essentially get paid twice. But we didn't care because we were going to get to make their figure one way or the other. And so that gave them the flexibility to allow us to do a program. And um, it was uh, it was really great. And if you remember, the first wave included Bret Hart and Ultimate Warrior. And that was also a huge signal to the collecting community. You know, Ultimate Warrior, like, wow, like, come on. 
because Warrior at the time was at, at real odds with WWE. And, uh, you know, it's a whole other story, but we, we had some very colorful conversations at that time. So uh, you can imagine what a fascinating uh, time it was for me, um, it, you know, having the opportunity to, to lead the charge on something at, at that age um, and just kind of taking it on without really knowing any better uh, that, it, that, it, that it could be such a big deal later on. I'm, I'm really thrilled that it is that we're still talking about it today. Now, there were a lot of personalities in that line, um, and you talked about yeah. a lot of the the main kind of now Hall of Famers. Um, we've heard stories about wrestlers that you did sign, but who was the one that you couldn't sign that um, you wish you had? Well, I mean, look, there were the big three for me, and that was Macho Man, Ricky Steamboat, and Owen Hart. Those, those were the ones that I felt were uh, the biggest misses. And for various reasons, um, whether it be, you know, intellectual property issues or whether it be other issues, um, it just stopped us from being able to do those figures. And I think the one thing that that line was very clear is that it was such a broad line. I mean, we literally did hundreds of classic superstars figures. Um, I think that's one of the things that was truly embraced by the community. It was like, wow, like we did A, B and C level characters we just knew how to assort them so that you know if we had someone that otherwise would not be all that necessarily popular we could celebrate them by maybe doing one every two case packs versus having another very popular a level character being you know two out of 12 or two out of whatever in the assortment um and being very well uh populated and so we you know we knew just enough about economics and how supply and demand worked to make this thing really cool and work with A, B, and C, I would say, level characters. So now, with somebody like, you know, the Warrior, and we mentioned him as, as part of the giveaway, how do figures like that get selected for the kind of level of promotional items that they that they were? So like that 1 out of 100, or the, the 1 out of 10 um, <laughs> Ultimate Warrior, like, how, how does that come about? So... I will tell you that, you know, some of it was just me sitting at my desk and going, okay, I think this is what's going to create excitement. Uh, it, it, th- certainly it was stupid in, in, in strategy because the objective was to continuously create excitement. And I don't think I overdid it. I mean, there was only a certain number of super limited figures over the seven year stretch that we were doing classic superstars or, or the entire line. Um, but I just like to keep collectors on their toes and keep them really surprised and like, you know, ready to buy something on the secondary market or at least cursing the fact that it exists. Because by doing that, you know, you always keep the line, you know, at the forefront of people's minds. Um, and here we are today, you know, celebrating some of the items that people cursed at the time because they were so limited. Uh, but yeah, look, that one of 100 uh, 2004 New York Toy Fair Ultimate Warrior exclusive is a, is a legendary figure. I was really thrilled to give it away. And uh, I think that the gentleman who received it has now been displaying it on uh, on social. So I hope that he really enjoys it. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it just it, it's so it's so interesting because it harkens back to kind of like the the. I guess like the the mail away culture, you know, of, of toys. Like it was always nice to have like that full set, and then all of a sudden you'd see the commercial, or you'd see an ad in a magazine, or on the back of a cereal box where you know you had to clip the UPCs and send it away, and you know, kind of hope that you had sent away fast enough to be one of the people to get it. But you know, when you're when I, I feel like it's it's almost um. It's almost like an uh, an homage to something like that when a when a company, you know, like Jax did and like what you did with Jax with those figures, where it's almost like just knowing that it exists is enough. Yeah, <laughs> like it's just yeah. it's, it's such a it's such a fun concept and such a such a huge part of collecting that's kind of missing now. Like there are variants and chases and things like that, but like those those like really really super exclusive toys. It's it's like part of the, the best part of the process. You know what? I agree with you. And I think that it's, but it also signals something else. It signals that the people who are managing the line are also fan fans of the line. 
like it, it signals like, wow, there's crazy stuff that could happen here. And it, it just keeps you excited. And, and honestly, the, there's a lot of boring stuff in the world of, uh, in the world of collectibles and you got to keep people on their toes. Yep. And, and now, you know, with, with online culture, you know, half the time you're not even going to stores to like hunt for these figures anymore you're just you know pre-ordering them online and waiting for them to be shipped so i i I feel like there's you know to your point you know that that element of excitement is is missing and the and the fact that you are you know behind so many fun lines now with with wicked cool toys and or jazzwares excuse me um you know i'm curious like do you have plans to do similar things for you know pokemon or for fortnite or for you know aew i was yeah. gonna ask isn't there isn't there something coming for AEW that's along those lines absolutely i mean there let's just put it this way all the tricks are going to be pulled out of the bag when it comes to aew um and we'll reveal them over the course of time you know i've i've always had a lot of patience uh remember i i pulled out the uh warrior america after what 15 years uh, because I just, I, I personally, like I said, I like to keep people guessing and excited over the course of a duration. Um, and you know, just when you think that you've seen it all, then you see something new. Uh, it, it is, uh, an art form and it's not just, uh, okay, here's the next wave. There's two of these and two of these. That's, that's just not the way to, to run a relationship with a collector community. Um, you should always expect the unexpected. So one of my favorite, I'm just going to outright say my favorite, um, but I know Eric really liked it too, um, and it was very unheralded as far as I, I think. Um, yeah. It was the Wicked Cool Toys Micromaniacs, the uh, board oh, really? game figures. I loved that. Um, so much fun. I, awesome. Yeah, I was like looking for different exclusives and stuff like that. I, I managed to find the vast majority. Um, and it was a really cool look original kind of fight style game um how did that idea come to be and now that jazzwares has aew could we see something along those lines for aew or really yeah. for anything else i think so look we, it was a very short-lived thing um but it wasn't it, it, it there's definitely potential there um i'm curious are you seeing i mean now that it's out of the marketplace are you seeing that there, did you feel like there was a significant demand for that particular business? Um, I honestly couldn't tell you, um, okay. but it was well, you, com- where- you completed I- it, didn't you? You have everything. Yeah, I, I looked That's for awesome. the different exclusives and, and whatnot and the different um, paint schemes. But yeah, that was one where I was like, I think th- this is cool. It's it's a, it was a good price point to be honest and i liked the way that the figures looked yes they were small but they were very um very stylized very cool yeah i'll tell you what i'm looking uh i'm looking on uh ebay as we speak and i'm looking at sold items and what do i see the there's definitely a market there's certainly a secondary market uh Randy Savage series one, 30 bucks. I mean, that's definitely many, many multiples over what we had in the, uh, in the marketplace. Fascinating. That's great. I love that. And I, I mean, in, in terms of, of playability too, like tabletop gaming is, is huge. When, when, yeah. when we were at Toy Fair and, and we'll, we'll get into how awesome we thought the Jazzwares booth was in a moment, but oh, thank you. when we, when we were at Toy Fair, we we're kind of it's taken taken aback by how front and center tabletop gaming is becoming again. Like we're right. we're coming back to like almost I don't want to say a new renaissance of tabletop gaming, but o- almost like there's you know a, a billion different versions of Dungeons and Dragons, which is you know never goes away. That that game has been around. You know Gary Gary Gygax. You know he he created a, a literal monster with that. But in, just in general, like the the presence of tabletop gaming is is so big right now that you know maybe something like an AEW Micromaniacs would would do really well. Good idea, really good idea. I uh, you're opening my eyes here. I mean, obviously <laughs> we're we're always looking for um, another way to experience the brand that doesn't cannibalize from the main item, and uh, I think what I'm seeing here as we speak 
is that there was certainly enough demand for Micromaniacs to sell through and then for there to be a really nice, like I said, secondary market business. I mean, as I look at this, um, it does. it's very clear to me that uh, it was something that could have continued to survive. Well, staying staying on the topic of of AEW um, and 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 wrestling toys, we know the Unrivaled line is is nearly upon us at this point. Yes. Um, and you, you've hinted at a couple of things. Is there is there anything else that that you guys have in store for that line that you you know maybe can throw a hint our way? Um, you know what I will say to you is that we're going to be delivering a new wave of product approximately every two months. And I think that we'll be even going faster than that uh, as soon as we uh, extend it. uh, You know, we're launching it at at Walmart and also at ringside. So, uh, but I think that it it is going to very quickly uh, extend beyond those retail outlets and at that time, you'll see even more development because when you have more retailers, you have to give exclusivity and opportunity for everyone to sort of shine. Um, I would say that the first season of the launch is about making sure that we get it right and then we extend. And it, it's been a very interesting time from a manufacturing standpoint. Um, you're, it's a situation where you're launching brands, and for me, I'm launching several brands, right smack dab in the middle of a global pandemic that happens every hundred years. And the factories are kind of like in the epicenter of where everything began. Um, so it's, it's, it's been exceptionally interesting. I mean, like, I, I would say that the product's great, uh, but there certainly are nuances, and I think that you'll probably see variations and variants. Um, in running changes uh, in ways that you probably wouldn't see normally. Like, I think there'll probably be, and I haven't said this yet, but I think there's probably going to be a uh, um, a second variant of Wave 1. I think the skin tones are good. They're going to be better. So we'll launch, and then there'll be a second variant as soon as we can implement a running change, just to make sure we get those skin tones a little bit more rich i would say so there you go so uh, there's a there's a uh there's one for you and and actually interestingly enough it reminds me a little bit of you know i'm sitting here next to this pokemon set and the reason why this set is so valuable is because it is the first edition shadowless version and what does that mean it just means that the first edition stamp is on it but also pokemon decided early on in the run that they needed to add a shadow to the box to make it look a little bit more 3D, I guess, or give it more dimensionalized. Um, and I was actually uh, having a good conversation with, uh, I have a weekly executive meeting with Pokemon, and I was taking them through that today. And it's amazing, you know, it's been 20 years, so no one remembers why that was done. But here, I'll tell you, it's done all the time. And every time it's done, you think back and you go, oh, man, I should have kept my shadowless cards. Well, nobody knows. Who knew? You know what I mean? Who knows what to look for at the time? It takes time for that to vet out. But I will tell you, we, we are very likely going to do a, a, a variant uh, run of uh, Series 1, uh, lighter skin tones to start, darker, more rich skin tones towards the back half or end of the run. I don't know which one is going to be more rare yet, but, uh, but that'll be something to look for. It's you know it's it's incredible you know and and again I'm gonna I'm gonna hint again at how how awesome our toy fair experience was but it's incredible speaking to you and and we spoke to to Mike to camp um oh yeah in the uh the the Fortnite the hidden Fortnite yeah. room <laughs> Great um Great guy. the the it it is very obvious the enthusiasm that you have for what you do and like the the fact that you are 
you know, broadcasting a running change shows that, you know, frankly, that, that you care, you know, that, that you, you really care about making sure that the best product possible is out there for not only collectors, but I'm sure you, you know, like you want to make sure that what you're putting out is, is of a quality enough that, you know, you're happy with. Absolutely. And, it's just it's i i personally i love seeing that i know like some people get like ticked off like there was the most recent one i could think of was mattel had a running change on the 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 baby yoda the child plush like there was one that came out that was more pale and that's the one i'm looking at and then they put out one that was a little more airbrushed and had some some darker details on it and for me it's like okay well as if you're collecting them and you're leaving them in the box or whatever you're doing now you have another one that you have to get which is awesome because now you have a reason to buy a second one and or two now you can compare and you can figure out which one you want which (laughs) which look you like better so i mean it like i I love i love that stuff and what's fun about it is every one of these running changes has a story behind it but most people are afraid to approach it because but i i the way i look at it is you guys are invited to the table of product development. I, I'm not afraid to say that things change and things evolve. I'm not afraid to say it because I, I want the product to be better and better. Uh, and in order to do that, I mean, sometimes you got to catch something as it goes and make improvements on the run. Um, that's probably what happened there. You're likely not to find out until you know, 10, 15 years from now when someone's talking about it on some sort of retrospective. And then you go, oh, that's why Baby Yoda had the you know, second look. Um, but it's always fun. I love it. As a collector, I do. I love it. So I, I'm not afraid of it. And I, I've always told my team that issues in production are just opportunities because ultimately, as long as you're honest with the collector community, they're cool with it. It's when you try to like avoid it and or you try to pretend like it's not part of the process or you don't, that's, it's almost like, it's almost like, um, pretending like the people that are collecting your product are not smart enough to handle it, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and I, I, think it's, I think it's so dumb because what I found is most of the time, the people that are collecting the product would do a better job managing the line than the people managing the line. And I've always taken that approach. And because I've taken that approach, I feel like I've been able to leverage the strength of the community. And so I think you'll see more of that too. Um, yeah, I mean, look, we are definitely going to be, do some super limited edition stuff. Um, and I'm going to try to figure out a way to include the community and stuff like that as well. So that I don't know how we'll do it. But if we did like a employee edition one day, we'll reserve one and make sure that, you know, some member of the community is, is the employee uh, consumer of that one. I mean, I don't know yet. We'll see. Sometimes these things happen on the go. and but I. Again, when you manage a line closely, you have to give a little bit of room to spontaneity. And because, again, that's what delights people. That, and it drives them nuts, but it also delights them. I was going to say, it makes it fun. It's, it's such a uh, level of attention to detail, too, that we, you know, as collectors, look for. Totally. When when Dave and I were at at Toy Fair and we you know got the tour of the the Jazzwares booth, we were fortunate enough to be in there when um, Kenny Omega and and Adam Page were in there with their you know their plastic likenesses, and you know we were asking them questions about as they were like holding their own figure, you know, um, and it was clear too that not only you know are you letting the community in but the 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 personalities the wrestlers themselves have a lot of input into the toys because i mean uh kenny was telling us like in detail about like you know how he suggested with like a color you know like he's happy that you know the outfit fits the way that it does and that he can bend this way and like it, it like how how much consideration do you give to you know some of the personalities that are going into the product Well, first of all, I just want to speak to AEW specifically. Um, I have never uh, seen a organization embrace the licensing uh, partner and the collector community the way I've seen AEW do it. Cody and those guys get it big time. Like they just get it. They, you've seen them promote on their show they do commercials for us 
we're going to be doing some really fun stuff with them very shortly where you see, you know, some, it'll feel like old school throwback uh, embracing of the product. And I think you kind of get a sense of what I'm talking about, but when you see it, it'll be like, remember the old LJN or Hasbro spots? Like there's going to be some amazing things on the horizon uh, in that regard, but they just get it. And, and they know that, um, the more their talent are attached to what's going on uh, on the consumer product side, uh, the more savvy the talent will be in terms of communicating with fans. And uh, so, yeah, I'd say we're all tied in. Um, I, I don't know the inner workings in terms of very specifically, does each athlete get to you know weigh in? Um, but I will say that I, I think that we've had a tremendous amount of integration with the talent pool there, people seem very, very happy. And uh, um, I think it has a lot to do with the seats that they have at the table. Yeah, and it's it, it's obvious that they do care. Like that that commercial that they had at the, the pay-per-view um, and that, that they had in the empty oh, stadium was um, mm-hmm. unbelievable. Like that was, it was so cool to see a, a wrestling figure toy commercial like that at a major event. It, it, it felt like it had been forever. For sure. Well, it, you know, even think of like the little bit of the bubbly set. Like that's oh yeah. When how often do you see something like that? Down to like the you know, it's the plates on the table. Well, we're gonna be doing more of that, my friend. There's no doubt. So the the one thing that w- that we didn't mention um a- about Toy Fair and we w- we were not at you know allowed to take photos of it was the the little UFC display that you guys had up. Yeah. Um, yes. Do you have? Can, can we talk about that at all? Do you have any updates yeah. on that line? Yeah, and I'll actually break something with you on that. So, um, and I think that I think that again, this is about respecting the collector community, and this is about sort of like giving you a behind the scenes peek as to decisions that are made. So, UFC Wave One, the scale of the figures are not in scale with the traditional WWE, AEW scale. It's not exactly scaled proportionally. They're more like five and a half inch. And um, we are going to celebrate that because there's there are Japanese style figures that are in that scale. So we're going to be calling that like the beta wave or the, the version zero wave. Um, and it will be the only wave that we do in that scale. And it will be very limited edition in scope and in availability. And then after that, we're going to be able to go into wave one with the more in scale to the traditional figures. It, it, you know what? It also gives us a little bit more flexibility in terms of tooling. Like almost everything that we're doing is, is um, specifically for the character. But as you know, when you're developing human bodies, and especially when you're developing them more realistically, especially now versus the way we used to, they were a little bit more super heroic scale and size that you can use parts and pieces and it allows a much more efficient use uh, across brands. But yeah, there's a little, there's a little feed for you there. We had something we haven't announced, um, but it's something that I think will be fun. And I want to give you the rationale as to why we did make that change in the first place. So that that update on on UFC is is incredible. You know, we both loved the way that they looked. You know, like I said, we we couldn't take photos of them, but um, you know, we're we're excited because the yeah, they're very the, cool. The cage looked great. The the likenesses looked awesome. So very excited to see how that line develops. Oh, awesome! And I and uh, and you know, you heard it here first in terms of the scale. And uh, like I said, you know, rationale and everything else. I I hope that uh, you uh, again. Because when you see the beta wave and what we're celebrating, you'll know that it was uh, you'll you'll know why we we made that switch later on. I, it's it's kind of one of those things where it's like the hint is kind of given is got the wheels turning a bit, but yeah, that's that's going to be cool. Yep. Um. So, what um one the other thing that we like to ask that we generally wrap up with is um what's the coolest thing in your collection and what's the weirdest thing in your collection. Huh. You know, one of the, there's I've a lot of cool stuff. I mean, again, I'm I've been in the I've been in the business that allowed me to have cool stuff for a long time. Um, I think my coolest wrestling thing is probably the fact that I have the Warrior America that I think is the only one. It's a one of three, but I 
one of them was given to the CEO and one of them was given uh, to Warrior. And I don't think either of those exist anymore. Um, and so I'm actually, I'm 99% sure that either exists. Uh, so the one that I have is probably the only one. And then my, my, uh, Hogan America, uh, and seeing those together, it's just really cool. <laughs> so from a wrestling standpoint, I, I, I will say, I love those two items. Um, in terms of collecting in general, every year I do a, uh, uh, a partner summit with Pokemon and Mr. Ishihara is one of the creators of Pokemon and there's a golf match and I'm terrible at golf. And when I say terrible, I mean like you've never seen someone as uncoordinated with golf as me. Like I am challenge one. accepted, man challenge accepted. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know if you think you're bad, just imagine slightly worse and it's probably me. But so they never put me on the team with anybody that's looking to actually win. Uh, but at the <laughs> end, uh, they um, kind of raffle the the individual uh, posts, or the the flagpoles, the 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 little fabric component that's at the top. It says Pokemon and the whole number and the and the and the partnership year. And I've been lucky; I've won the raffle twice. So I have two of the flags from uh, these Pokemon partnership meetings. Uh, signed by Mr. Ishihara. And uh, that is some, th I mean, those are so cool. I'll have to show one on social media soon. Um, it's one of my favorite things that I have, for sure. That's, that's very incredible. Cool. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's awesome. awesome. Yeah, so I love that. And then, uh, honestly, there's, there's so much. There's so much. Where do I begin? Like, when I was a kid, um, one thing that I haven't really gotten into, but when I was a kid, I wrote <clears throat> a thousand letters. Uh, I was 16 years old, um, and I didn't know what to do with my life. Like I said, I grew up in Mississippi and Tennessee, and I didn't have a real specific vision. I just knew that I wanted to be successful. Um, and so I wrote a thousand letters to some of the most known and remarkable and achieved people um, in, in the world. And I received, uh, of the thousand letters, I received like almost 200 of them, 200 of them back with answers. So I have letters from Mother Teresa and presidents and m massive, you know, entertainment stars like Jimmy Stewart from back in the day. Oh man. And That's all awesome. they're shockingly cool. Um and I'm just I'll start sharing them too on my uh my Twitter and Instagram. Well, Jeremy is there is there anything that you'd like to plug before we we let you go for the the evening is is you know do where can people follow you what do you want them to know about and uh and yeah anything else that you wanted uh, our audience to know oh my gosh what do i want you to know well i just want you to know i care and i want you to know that we're going to make mistakes but when we do we'll figure out a way to to make them at least fun for the collector um and that you know, we'll always be forthright uh, in terms of what's going on, uh, especially now, because right now, again, like if if and again, I'm not saying because I'm not in the background of what Mattel uh, does or doesn't do. I worked there 20 years ago. But if you see a variant of Baby Yoda, and that's probably one of the biggest items that they've done in decades, it, it's a real good indicator as to how challenging manufacturing is in COVID years where you really even can't have your designer sitting there at the factory, which on a launch is like a mind number. Um, but yeah, like that's what I want you to know. I want you to know that we're going to be forthright. We're going to tell you the way it is. We're going to do things that probably make you happy most of the time and occasionally piss you off. And um, but we're going to be accessible. And so, you know, whether it's on Halo, Micro Machines, Fortnite, Roblox, AEW, UFC, uh, and so on, Pokemon, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, but interestingly enough, the biggest thing might be the launch of uh, a preschool property that, uh, that I signed um, called Coco Melon. And you know Coco Melon if you have like a two year old. But you don't know Coco Melon if you have like a four year old. <laughs> Essentially, uh, you know, like you see ratings and you're like, wow, 
you know, that show did a 1.2 or whatever. Um, but Coco Melon last week did 1.1 billion views on social media. Oh my so, God. Yeah. And that's, that's crazy. One the, that's one of the coolest things about toys and being in the toy business is that you really get to chase crazy, crazy dreams. You never know what's going to be next. We went from it when we started this company, we went from being a secondary uh, licensee on Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles on their relaunch to having a Girl Scouts oven, cookie maker oven, to bringing back Teddy Ruxpin, to being the global partner on Pokemon, to being the global partner on Pokemon and Cabbage Patch Kids and Micro Machines and Halo and Coco Melon AEW, uh, to selling the company and still retaining an ownership share that we could then drive one of the top 10 toy companies in the world. And that's what we're doing with Jazzwares. So I guess what I just want you guys to take away from this is that anything that you dream, if you really, really, really go after it and you stick to it and you get your ass kicked, that you could achieve it. But it takes a tremendous amount of stick to itness. You've got to stick to it because it's going to try to shake you. It's like riding a bucking bronco and you have to stay on it. And if it kicks you off, you've got to figure out how to get back on. And that's, that is the key to success. Uh, follow your passions and then uh, try to everything that you can to achieve them. And if you do, you've got to give back. And uh, I, I think I'm in the give back mode right now, as, as uh, like I said before. Well, certainly. Thank you for everything that you, you're doing to give back to the community. Thank you for taking the time to be here. And, and you guys heard it here first. Stick to your dreams. Never give up. Jeremy said so. That's right. That's right. And if you, uh, if you guys, if anybody's interested in finding me on uh, Twitter, it's at Jeremy Com. And if you're looking to find me on Instagram, it's at Jeremy Padauer, P-A-D-A-W-E-R. And there you go. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jeremy. We appreciate it. Great chatting. And uh, to the collector community, thank you so much. Looking forward to uh, great years ahead. Thank you, dear listener, for hanging out with us today. Subscribe, rate, and review us wherever you listen, and then tell your friends to do it. Thanks also to Joe Azari, the golden voice behind our intro. Our music is Game Boy Horror by the Zombie Dandies. Find more about them both in our show notes. Follow us on social media at AIC underscore podcast on Instagram and Twitter. Stop by and say hi. Show us your toy hauls and share your toy stories. Maybe we'll talk about it in a future episode. Don't try this at home. Void where prohibited and some assembly required. Each sold separately, not a flying toy. Consult a physician if your toy run exceeds more than four hours. This has been a non-productive media presentation. Executive producer, Frank Hablawi. This program and many others like it on the Non-Productive Network is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives License. Please share it, but ask before trying to change it or sell it. For more information, visit non-productive.com.